It's my pleasure to introduce Baptiste Lefian, who's going to be talking to us about the landscape problem and the multiverse. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks a lot to the organizers for this great event. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a bit more about that. Philosophical, less technical than the two talks we just had, but hopefully will be um, interesting for most of you. So um, it's a joint project uh, with James Reed, and what I want to talk about is about this idea of uh, multiverse, um, because several approaches in physics seem to claim that there is uh, something like a plurality of universes. I mean, of course, it's a very contentious claim, but you can find this kind of claim in many places, for instance in one approach to quantum gravity with string theory, uh, in a particular approach to quantum mechanics with the many world uh, approach, uh, or in cosmology with eternal inflation and many other uh, models. Um, so a general problem is, well, could we really learn from physics that we uh, inhabit a multiverse? Uh, how serious should we be about this idea? And what I want to do today is to uh, focus on this uh, problem through a particular angle, namely the landscape problem in uh, string theory. And the first thing I want to argue for today is that, well, this question being whether there actually is uh, a landscape problem. And second, whether the existence, um, I want to, um, to claim that still, nonetheless, the existence of a multiverse uh, might be a scientific claim. All right, so uh, let's start with the landscape uh, problem. So string theory uh, is consistent with a vast range of solutions. And the theory can be used to derive, depending upon the input geometrical assumptions that one makes, a vast range of different quantum field theories, giving rise to the uh, so-called landscape problem. So here, the landscape is a space of solutions. No, no story about uh, all the universes yet. And interestingly, well, string theories were initially expecting string theory to have only one solution. That was an old pop, uh, to quote uh, Kate Sobasubara. Um, but then, this view has been supplanted by the landscape view uh, that string theory will probably end up having many uh, solutions, a huge number of solutions. And so at first glance, what we could say is that, in a way, the nostalgia of the old hope of getting one solution only from string theory has motivated theories to reify the landscape into uh, one multiverse. But uh, wait, uh, if we present things like that, um, it seems a bit weird, right? Because what about the general theory of relativity? Uh, GR seems to have, well, it has many solutions that do not correspond to the actual world. Um, it's not usually regarded as being an issue for general relativity. So here is a quote from uh, Michael Green. This is posed, problem with a theory having many solutions has never been a problem before in science. There is a landscape of solution to general relativity. Yet nobody says that the theory, um, the theory is nonsense because only a few of them describe the physics we observe while the rest appear to be irrelevant. So why is, uh, is the existence of many solutions uh, taken to be a particular issue? in the context of string theory, uh, when it's not in the context of general relativity. Well, this difference uh, of reaction uh, um, might take its roots uh, in the largely accepted view that our current most fundamental theories at the moment in physics are not absolutely fundamental. GR has many solutions, and it's not a problem, because GR is not uh, a fundamental theory. Sorry, is uh, this modeling, uh, let's say about this is uh, what follows. Why does general relativity so extravagantly overperform its job, giving us just predictions for the actual universe, but also for uh, predictions for an infinite number of universes that never exist? The only conclusion to draw is that general relativity is not the correct cosmo cosmological theory. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to see here that there is this idea that an absolutely fundamental theory, a final theory, should just have one solution. So I want to uh, discuss several issues. So first, here are two potential issues one might perhaps a bit naively raised uh, against uh, this existence of a landscape of solutions. First, 
the landscape problem undermines the predictive power of string theory. Second, the landscape problem undermines the explanatory power of string of theory. So let's have a look first at the predict predictive power of string theory. Well, uh, what do we mean exactly by, by that, by predictive power? Well, the idea is that given the empirical data observed thus far, we are able to identify at least one solution uh, of the theory in question, compatible with that empirical data. And such solutions can then be used to make new predictions that could turn out, uh, but do not have, to be correct. On this understanding, the total number of, of solutions of the theory on the consideration is irrelevant to the predictive capacity of the theory. What is relevant is the number of solutions of the theory which are compatible with the empirical data gathered thus far. So what, matter, uh, what matters is whether that theory can be used to make further predictions in the actual world. And the landscape does not per se speak against this problem of predictive power. In fact, given the dearth of models of string theory compatible with the standard model, right, we have to find one, the risk of, for string theory is to be potentially falsified rather than to be uh, unfalsifiable, which is a good thing for scientific theory. So what about uh, the explanatory power of string theory? Um, so is, is there anything problematic with string theory when it comes to uh, its capacity to explain things. Well, here I think it's really important to distinguish between two things. Uh, first, there are situations where um, you can use um, the more fundamental theory to explain some features of a derivative theory. Um, like when you want to explain, for instance, uh, 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 proportionality of gravitational mass uh, uh, initial uh, mass in Newtonian physics by using GR. And that is a completely different thing to want to explain all the features of a fundamental theory, right? Then it's something else that we want to do, is to give an explanation, an ultimate explanation of all the features of the more fundamental theory. So here I think it's really important to notice that because we may not give an explanation of all the features of string theory, while it does not follow that string theory is not explanatory. Right. So from this idea of a landscape of solutions, um, I don't believe there is something really problematic uh, with string theory. <coughs> um, it's predictive and has explanatory power. So the landscape problem is not uh, a genuine problem, at least yet, when we have just uh, said that. And so the landscape of solutions of string theory taken alone should not motivate us to posit the existence of a multiverse. Um, so now I want to introduce this idea of a multiverse to make a few considerations about, about that to then come back to what I just said. So this idea of a multiverse, basically you take all the solutions uh, of, the, uh, of the previous theory, you reify them, you say that there is a universe associated with each of the solutions and you say that well, we live in a multiverse uh, comprised of all those universe, universes composing the multiverse. So here is the first question, is there something new with respect to predictive power when moving from the landscape to the multiverse? Well, arguably no, because insofar as string theory itself can be predictive, so too can string theory embedded in this multiverse. Again, what matters here is whether that theory can be used to make further predictions in our universe. Uh, and the existence of all the universes doesn't really matter. Thus, uh, the multiverse doesn't pose a special problem when it comes to the issue of falsifiability. But then, um, what's the motivation? Uh, from string theory to, to posit the existence of a multiverse. If there is no issue of predictability with string theory without a multiverse, why are many or at least some physicists willing to posit the existence of a multiverse? Well, I guess one strong motivation is that it's supposed to augment the explanatory power uh, of the framework. 
And indeed, I want to uh, start talking about rationalism and to introduce a few more abstract points about the motivations you can find in uh, um, the beliefs of, of people working on quantum gravity. String theory is often regarded not only as a theory of quantum gravity, but also as the final theory of everything. And the final theory is supposed to be uh, absolutely fundamental in the sense that uh, there should be nothing left to explain, at least in some sense. It's one way to characterize this finality claim, at least about the physical world. And Smolin um, believes that if an absolutely fundamental theory has more than one non-trivial solution, uh, we need an explanation for why our actual world corresponds to a particular solution uh, of the landscape. Uh, right, so here you have this idea of, of, of final, finality. Uh, if you have a final theory, you want to explain why this solution rather than another solution. But why exactly should we uh, believe this? Well, so Smith's reason is that he believes in something extremely powerful but also extremely uh, question begging. This is the principle of uh, sufficient reason, or at least he mentioned his motivation this were uh, uh, in, in the paper. Uh, and roughly the idea is that everything must have an explanation, a reason for why it is as it is. So here is a, a quote from Smolin. Abrigam, like this principle of sufficient reason, because I believe it helps greatly to clarify the issues that we confront in seeking a solution to the landscape problem. In particular, the principle of sufficient reason not only tells us that laws must evolve to be explained and that there must be a dynamical explanation for the initial conditions of the universe. It greatly constrains the context in which we fix those dynamical explanations which led to the selection of the laws and initial conditions of our universe. So, yes, yeah, so you have this idea of explaining a lot of things. And Smolin is explicit that he wants to explain some fundamental facts. First, you want to explain the form of the effective laws of nature. Um, namely, the idea that we have one set of laws, a bubble universe in the multiverse, represented by some deeper theory. You also want to explain the parameter values in those effective theories by appeal, for instance, to some uh, geometries, geometries associated with each uh, bubble universe. Anyone also to explain uh, um, the various possible initial conditions uh, by embedding each model of one theory uh, with its own initial conditions into one model of a multiverse theory. Excuse me. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but there's something I'm simply not following. Whenever you explain something, you explain in terms of something else. Yeah. There is no possibility of explaining something without departing from somewhere. So what is this problem of explaining everything? Okay, I'm going to go to, to get to that. Uh, that's the next part. Uh, but I'm happy to get back to you if I'm not satisfied. So what I just want to say here is that clearly these uh, reasons to embrace a multiverse are not directly related to the need to account for the empirical data in the actual world. We have something a bit more rational going on here. And what I want to notice here is that for Smolin, explanation gets, goes far beyond explaining states of some systems in reference to dynamical laws and initial conditions. Um, here's another quote from him. So it was not in the final uh, version of the paper, it's only in the preprint version. Uh, maybe for the kind of reasons that you just uh, mentioned. He writes, if the M theory is to be the real theory of everything, it must, it must be formulated in such a way that we cannot further inquire as to why these laws and why these initial conditions. It must somehow furnish its own sufficient reason. So it's still some kind of idea in the back of, uh, it's, not any, it's not in the final paper, uh, but you have many um, hints of this kind of ideas in the, in the paper. So it's certainly true that the uh, principle of sufficient reason acts as a useful guiding principle in theory construction. I won't be denying that, and of course we should accept this uh, idea and try to find cause and reason to make progress in science. But um, 
there may be some problems when you want to apply in a very universal way this, this principle of sufficient reason. Uh, and the first issue regards Smolin's claim that dynamical laws and initial conditions should be explained. Um, so he says that laws must evolve in order to explain it. So he thinks that we need some kind of temporal explanation of laws. Uh, and also thinks that initial conditions should be explained uh, with some kind of anthropic reasoning, or in this case, a kind of temporal explanation with a cosmological selection principle. Um, but this, let's start with the, the laws first. This claim that laws must evolve in order to be explained uh, is highly problematic. In fact, it seems to disregard much of the literature on the ontology of laws of nature, you find the literature, the philosophical literature, because there you find many accounts to explain what uh, are laws of nature of a different, more philosophical sort. For instance, by uh, which, which, for instance, by saying that laws are just regularities, or by identifying laws as abstract second order relations connecting first order properties, uh, or with disposition. I mean, you have many different accounts, and all of them are explanations of, of laws of nature. And they are not really scientific explanations, uh, and they are not temporal explanations. But still, it's a bit problematic to say that in order to explain laws, we need to, to provide some kind of historical scenario. And furthermore, the possible emergence of space-time from a non-special temporal structure in quantum gravity kind of shed doubt on, the, on this idea that all non-logical, I mean, not only logical, uh, scientific explanations should involve time. It seems like a very strong claim to mention that all scientific explanations should uh, involve time. Um, and finally, well, it's also a rationalist assumption that laws, including their forms and the parameter values, uh, should be explained to begin with. Um, again, it's like a healthy guiding principle to try to explain that. Uh, <coughs> but something else to say is that it must be like that. They must have a reason. What about uh, explaining the initial conditions of the universe? Well, Again, you can use some kind of uh, entropic principle or the cosmological selection principle to give an explanation of those initial conditions. Um, and again, I want to praise that again. Uh, it's of course very interesting guiding principles that we should use. But claiming that the cosmological initial conditions must have an explanation is a very strong claim. And to me, it seems to uh, kind of overgeneralize the scientific practice? Yes? Just a quick question. What do you mean by cosmological selection principle? I, have, um, I was thinking about Smolin's idea that there is some kind of um, evolution of effective field series, uh, some kind of uh, selection principle in comparison to the uh, to case in, in biology with a theory of evolution. So uh, having in mind uh, Smolin's picture of that. Um, yeah, so this idea of explaining initial conditions, I mean, the very distinction between uh, initial conditions and laws, it seems that something very that we use all the time in many contexts, but it's not that trivial to say that it can be generalized to a uh, cosmological level and that it makes sense to try to explain the universe uh, like that. So I want to um, now raise another issue with this idea. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. The, if, if the cosmological selection principle is like uh, Smolin's uh, one, and it's analogous to a natural selection principle like in Darwin's uh, natural evolution, how can it explain the initial conditions? It's rather the other way around. It's a, it's a principle that almost tells you that it doesn't really matter what the initial conditions were. The evolution of the system or the set of systems, the species, uh, has a certain rule 
for you know, keeping alive uh, some possibilities and removing the others. So you may explain the current state as the most likely, but doesn't really say anything about the initial conditions. In a sense, it makes it irrelevant. But I guess it depends on what you mean by the there, unless I guess I'm, I'm not understanding you know, yeah. in what sense you're talking about initial conditions. Yeah, I think about the selections. cosmological initial conditions of our universe. And you can give an explanation for why uh, it's very probable to be very likely. Sorry, it's very likely to be in one universe with those parameters, um, with those uh, apparent initial conditions at the beginning of the universe, because you have some evolutions of the parameters. So it's how I will understand this idea that it explains um, the apparent cosmological uh, initial conditions of the actual universe in which we are. I think it's what he, he says in the paper. Yeah, so coming back to this idea of um, everything must have a reason, right? Um, another problem is that, well, of course, there were a lot of past successes using the principle of sufficient reason. And again, it's a very useful again principle. But is it really enough to think that as a matter of necessity, it has to always work in any context? Um, it seems that from a purely empirical perspective, here we have some kind of leap of faith. Uh, if we think that it must universally apply in any context about anything. Um, but what about a more rationalist perspective? Uh, could we argue a priori uh, that the principle of sufficient reason universally applied, that everything must have a reason? So if you look at the debates uh, in, in metaphysics, uh, it's interesting to see that this principle used to be rejected uh, uh, between uh, in the 80s uh, until two, two, 2000 because of some arguments given by uh, von Inbegen and Bennett. So I don't really want to discuss the details of these arguments, but just to give you a feel, it's the kind of arguments that go like this. Uh, if you take the list of all the contingent facts composing the world, uh, the totality of this fact is itself a fact. Uh, and you want to ask, does this fact have an explanation? Um, and you want to say yes, because everything must have a reason. So it must, it must be an explanation for this fact. Um, but no, if this fact is itself contingent, it means it's already part of the list of facts, so it must explain itself, uh, which has been thought to be a bit problematic. And if it's a necessary fact, uh, people think that it entails that all the previously thought contingent facts are in fact necessary, and so everything becomes necessary. So this argument is not uh, accepted anymore, because people have criticized many assumptions there. Um, but it's just really to give you a feel of what it could mean to argue for the PSR on purely a prior right grounds without referring to physics. So as I said, this argument was shown to be inclusive, um, and there is a revival because, uh, because of this. But it's not because this argument is thought to be incorrect now that uh, there is a conclusive, a prior right argument in favor of the PSR. So, again, I think, in fact, if you think about it, uh, this idea of an a priori argument backing uh, the PSR, well, again, requires a leap of faith, because you have to accept that it's possible to settle a priori, whether or not everything can be explained. And to me, it seems a bit dubious, uh, at least if you have a more empiricist perspective. So both uh, the principle of sufficient reason and the idea that we can discover a priori whether uh, the PSR is correct or not uh, rely on some faith in some sort of rationalism. So now maybe I think, but what do I mean exactly by that? So here is what I mean by rationalism. is the view that reason is absolutely powerful and can in principle explain everything about the most generic aspects of the world uh, with science. And it stands in opposition to empiricism, the view that anything which is not subject to empirical testing, or is strongly suggested by empirical science, is question begging, uh, when taken as being more than just a guiding principle in theory construction. Um, so, 
again, seeking to explain cosmological initial conditions and laws of nature is fine as a guiding principle. But there must be good uh, empirical reason to believe that there must be uh, a reason for why they are as they are. So there is a landscape problem only if one accepts rationalist motivations. And then only one may be tempted to move from the landscape problem to the existence of a multiverse. Um, so now I'm done with this part, and what I want to do is to uh, just make a few remarks about how it could uh, maybe relate to eternal inflation and cosmology. It's still very uh, sketchy. I don't really have time to explore in detail this literature, so we'll just make a few points. Um, so we start by this uh, quote from uh, Yasunori Umara. The eternal inflation picture is obtained by just using general relativity, and all this energy scale associated with this process is much smaller than the Planck scale, where we believe that the theory is correct. The only aspect you need for this particular purpose from string theory is a lot of different vacuum, a lot of different universes where the vacuum energy is different. As long as that aspect stays in whatever theory of quantum gravity, then that's enough to keep this picture. So it's just to say that, uh, I mean, there is much debate about the relationship between string theory and internal inflation. Uh, here this quote shows that there is no necessary connection uh, between uh, string theory. So, Eternal inflation does not stand and fall with string theory. So it also means that the eternal inflation multiverse does not stand and fall with string theory. Rather, string theory offers a convenient theoretical tool to make sense of the creation of universes uh, in the background of eternal inflation. So as long as the theory, um, as the vacuum energy remains the parameter of of one theory of quantum gravity, well, it's all inflation is fine. So what's really important here, I think, is that the move from the landscape of solutions to a multiverse might be justified externally by eternal inflation and its associated empirical signatures, but it doesn't seem to support string theory in particular. Um, so yet there is what I want you to say is that um, although we don't have uh, motivations uh, from string theory alone to accept the existence of the multiverse. Uh, maybe we could have more empiricist motivations coming from a, a cosmological model, but it's a different line of, of uh, justification. So, should we be impressed by the fact that both string theory and eternal inflation suggest the existence of a multiverse? Well, I guess it depends on how strong the suggestion is, right, and how strong. Um, the justification of string theory and eternal inflation is. So I suspect here again, I will be healthy to be a bit skeptic about the rationalist motivations um, um, in the context of eternal inflation. But as I just said, maybe there are more um, empiricist motivations to take seriously the idea of, uh, of a multiverse uh, uh, in, in cosmology. So you have many scenarios, like with uh, Penrose conformal, um, um, uh, cyclic conformal cosmology, or this idea of collisions between global universes. Um, I've read that some, I've, that some predictions of a small negative curvature from internal inflation, uh, that it's hard to distinguish it from vanishing curvature, but these are some uh, attempts to find some uh, empirical signatures of those models. So now I want also to mention that I'm aware that some issues about uh, eternal inflation, uh, like you know, that we can only dismiss models and not the theory as a whole. Sorry, it's, uh, Chris Mink uh, mentioned uh, talking about this um, high flexibility of the framework, and that's uh, a problem. Given a fixed choice for the inflation field, discrepancies with observations will force theorists. Uh, to elaborate the model, possibly identifying new features of the early universe in the process. At present, the choice of inflationary, inflationary models is too flexible to support this kind of approach. Um, so I'm aware that there is a major problem. So, and there is a predictability crisis there. But um, first, it seems that 
well, we could still make some scientific progress by uh, narrowing the space of possible solutions. And second, maybe by combining uh, quantum gravity with um, uh, eternal inflation, we might, might get enough constraints to, 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 to really shrink down the space of the solution and make it more uh, predictive. So these are some hopes that it could be, uh, in principle, possible to do. All right, and before, uh, just to conclude, just a few notes about some more philosophical multiverse, multiverses. Um, as some of you know, you have probably two main uh, philosophical multiverses, in a very broad sense of, of a multiverse. You have David Lewis' model realism, that any possible world exists. And you have uh, Max Tegmark's mathematical, mathematical universe hypothesis, like all the mathematical structures uh, exist. Uh, well, just to comment on that, uh, with respect to the distinction I introduced between rationalist and empiricist motivations. So, of course, the philosophical multiverse seems to be motivated only by uh, rationalist a priori motivations and not really by science. However, um, I think it's interesting to, to remember that there might be some empirical constraints that we might learn through, through physics that could uh, have an impact on how plausible those philosophical views are. So for instance, uh, uh, Christian Buttress has a paper where he views and model realism uh, is in tension with the potential emergence of space-time. Um, so it might come as some kind of, um, if it were to be confirmed that space-time emerged from a non-space number structure, um, Modern realism, as introduced by David Lewis, will collapse because he needs this idea of uh, possible world being spatial temporally disconnected. So he needs this idea of space and being fundamental. So if you lose this, well then you cannot really have uh, his philosophical view of the of, of, of modal realism. So it doesn't mean that uh, I'm saying that because it might be real, uh, ruled out. On I, I missed the point where, where it needed to be connected. Well, why are these multiple universes need to be connected? I mean, I thought you argued that this emergence of space time requires these entities to be disconnected and somehow that negates the possibility of the model so existing. Why, why, why is the connected part needed? So it's because uh, it's how uh, David Lewis make a distinction between what's actual and what's only possible. So he used a, a criterion of causal slash spatial temporal connectivity. He said that one word is everything which is spatial temporally connected, and everything which is not spatial temporally connected to our world is not our world, it's another world. So it's just the way you define things, and you need to define this properly reasons, uh, but there is a tension with this idea that space-time might, might emerge and not be fundamental. Because in his view, he really needs this fundamentality of um, spatial temporal connection and spatial temporal disconnection. Um, yeah, so I, I don't want to say that uh, David Lewis' model realism is scientific because it could be ruled out scientific ground, but still I think it's interesting to see that some metaphysical claims that might seem out of uh, empirical reach uh, in some situations can in fact turn out to be. But as a result, I uh, think we should be a bit skeptic to some degree about our capacity to know um, what lies out of empirical reach in general as a matter of principle. It's also a way to be a bit careful when we think about maybe this multiverse idea just too um, abstract and too far away from empirical testing to be interesting. I think we should be really careful about giving this kind of uh, justifications. So just to sum up, uh, on the one hand, string theory having a landscape of solution is not as problematic as what is claimed in the literature. The inference from a landscape of solutions to the existence of a multiverse can be made sound if one accepts rationalist claims um, 
that we need to explain the parameters involved in the theories, that we must explain the initial conditions. But those rationalist claims are difficult to justify because they rely on society and this principle of sufficient reason, and there is a leap of faith there to think that it applies to uh, everything. On the other hand, uh, multiverses models are scientific if they have an empirical signature in a broad sense. So, empiricists should consider seriously, uh, according to me, uh, multiverse scenarios, since such models cannot be dismissed as unscientific sorry, on a purely a priori front. Thank you very much. Just over 20 minutes, but okay. 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 Uh, 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 let me first um, emphasize what is often um, mixed in, uh, especially in intercircle discussion. Let's make a very strong. Let's let's the the raw align between um, in multiverses in the narrow sense, uh, in the narrow sense which arise as a consequence of practically all intellectual models, and multiverses in much in general and the much, in the much more um, a speculative sense which follows from the, the string figure. In the um, intellectual models, indeed, we have a it's a generic prediction, practically in all models, which prior to they show that the old statement that inflation ex explains the uh, homogeneity of the of the universe is a is a is a an Iran statement. Okay, so it um, it, it explains the homogeneity only in some in some um, in some was finite equivalent. And so in genetic gen gen prediction that there are, uh, exist uh, in post inflationary uh, 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 universes uh, where uh, it is different <coughs> actually infinite number of uh, parts of space time which are not which are no more in causal connection. More exactly which are which which do not lie in the past and future light column of any given observer. Okay, but the physics in all of these uh, multiverses is the same. In particular, the cosmological constant is the same and equal to the absorber. It's a completely independent speculation, okay, no. hypothesis of the string figure that the it might be many other models, also, but once more, it's uh, at this level, it's only it's only a speculation. And uh, once more, returning to the multiverses in the narrow sense, I would say it's nothing um, unscientific. And what I want to emphasize is essentially the same picture which we have in the in the usual Einstein gravity. We are we are sure that the uh, exist many e black holes in our in our universe we actually see them and integral parts of these different black holes are outside of past light light holes of any given observer. So and and nobody said that it's it's unscientific to investigate what happens inside black holes. So in this sense it is multiverse once more in the narrow sense, in the narrow sense, which, which follows from inflation and models, is no more uh, is no more unscientific. But as I said, investigations of integral different Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, what you said. Um, except Paris, when you said that no one thinks that they are unscientific. I mean, 
find many different opinions, uh, right, uh, in the physics community. But I mean, what I was trying to do is just to um, to gesture toward a, a bad way to be willing to justify the existence of a multiverse um, with this landscape problem. Um, I think that we must explain many things. I mean, it's an interesting guiding principle, and maybe it can relate to other parts of physics and, and become externally justified. Uh, but still, we should be just be careful about uh, putting too much trust in, in, in rationalist principles, such as the principle of sufficient reason. Um, because, yeah, that's what no, I was trying to... What, what, my, when my final comment went, okay, uh, I would say that as far as far as we work, uh, uh, my impression that rationals, rationalist principle is working. What's what? Of course, if we don't be, if we don't pretend that we understand everything, okay. But uh, as far as we explain one thing, as you said, using other thing, more exactly if we find some new empirical fundamental constant and we express it through known fundamental constants, okay? It works as far as far it works. So, um, I'm curious about uh, one kind of motivation for reifying the multiverse that I think comes up in some of the literature that you didn't mention. So I think there's a general question we reason in science all the time with spaces of possible models, and so why would you take those as being actually existing elements of an ensemble? And I think sometimes people are motivated by the idea that, uh, and I'm not endorsing this, but that if you think of, uh, think of uh, a selection from elements of an ensemble, that you can give a different kind of account of that if it's an actually existing ensemble, so that you can say, how do we, you know, why do we see what we see? Well, we're uh, anthropically selected from an actually existing ensemble of possible universes. And I think that's actually one motivation for some of the string theory uh, landscape discussions to take the landscape as actually existing parts of, or actually existing elements of an ensemble. But then you can motivate, you can uh, appeal to this sort of selection reasoning. So again, I'm not endorsing that, but I'm just wondering, because you, you mentioned early on, it's not clear why they reify these different solutions, and I think that's one motivation I've seen. Yeah, that's why I might want to mention the entropic principle. Um, yeah, I think it's... Um, um, I agree, it's, it's a prima facie <laughs> appealing way to think about things, but then if you want to balance that with um, another scenario in which you just have a brute fact that we happen to live in this uh, world corresponding to one dynamical solution. How are you going to choose? I mean, it seems to me that if you want to choose from the former scenario, then you need some kind of uh, rationalist principles that you cannot uh, discover and you can really relate to the empirical world. Go ahead. You, you point it to me at all. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, probably it's, it's, it's connected to, 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 to your comment uh, right now, but or also to, to your uh, initial talk. If I understand correctly, this lack of, of models, of, of concrete realizations of string theory that may fit with our observed universe, with the known facts of our, our universe, uh, may be taken as a strong indication, and here I'm speculating, that perhaps the set of possible solutions to the string theory that are compatible with our universe may be of measure zero. And in that case, as an act of desperation, I think, you would be tempted to adopt the multiverse as the only possible escape using them, the argument. Okay, it's true, it's a measure zero, but actually all of them are real. Are real. <coughs> and of course we happen to be in the one that is compatible with humans and so forth. So, so I would 
see that as an act of desperation by somebody extremely attached to string theory, if it turns out that the problem they are having in finding solutions indicates you know, zero measure of, of possible solutions. Thank you, I agree. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, can, uh, earlier in the talk, you, you cited Carol, and you said something to the effect of, um, you know, one of the reasons why you might think these multiverse hypotheses is a scientific hypothesis is because it narrows the space of possibility. I guess, I'm curious, could you be a little bit more specific about what you mean by that? Um, I mean, I guess... I, I mean, on, on some views of theory space, it might seem to, it seems to me it would expand the space of possible solutions, not narrow it. So, what do you, what do you have in mind by that? Mind I mean, the idea was, um, so you have this uh, predictability crisis and it's on uh, inflation because you can, the problem is that uh, you can make the framework consistent with too many things. And one way to put the problem is that you cannot, uh, very diff seems difficult to roll out the theory on empirical ground, but you can still roll out models of the theory. <coughs> and and Sean Carroll in the paper is saying, well, probably it's not fully satisfying, but still it's it comes at some progress to, to roll out some models. Just, Yeah, I have a question, but I would like to go beyond the, the example that you gave for a multiverse and landscape. So from the point of view of yourself as uh, belonging to philosophy, I believe, I would like to ask you, so where do you have to draw the line and say we accept certain things, we're not going to understand them? Because from our point of view, in as physicists, we try to understand everything. So here is a general question. What, because you know, uh, Ages ago, people would have start, stopped doing anything in physics and that's how it is. I mean, the sun and the, 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 the planets have this, that's how it is, I'm not trying to explain it. So, uh, according to you, uh, where well, we should draw the line and accept certain things that we cannot, uh, we can never explain. And uh, you, you said at some point in your, in your slides that some to claim that we can understand everything is a big claim or something like that. So, so can you? Uh, forget what physicists said, but from your point of view, wow, what, I mean, what, what do you stand? So I guess, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, the first thing to say is that I think we should really try to explain everything all the time, right? It's, it's the right way to go. Uh, we should not refrain ourselves to try to explain things when we think that may be room for finding an explanation, so we have to explore all of Pass. Uh, but it's more like a pragmatic uh, view, right? It's what we should do. Uh, then it seems to me you're asking a more uh, epistemological, or maybe metaphysical question, which is, leaving this aside, can we, could we explain in principle everything, right? That's what you're on. Um, and here I'm just a skeptic. Uh, I think that uh, we cannot know the answer to this question. We can just know that. We should not be lazy, right? We should try to always do some work to explain as much as we can. Um, but, and maybe it seems reasonable to think that we will explain principle or facts. But when you start asking more abstract questions about, for instance, whether could we explain laws of nature uh, in general, the existence of law of nature, of why they are as they are, then I think we are moving to a different level. It's far more speculative and uh, I don't have any answer to that. Uh, I would be tempted to be a bit skeptic about it and say, well, we'll probably never know uh, whether everything can absolutely be explained. Uh, thank you. So my question, I'll, I'll address it to you, is probably opposed to someone more like Smolin who actually endorses the multiverse as an explanation for certain things. Um, but if we, or if Smolin wishes to explain all things, presumably we still are left with an explanation of M theory or the multiverse itself. So can we ever really, so Daniel said at one point, we always explain something in terms of something else, and in this case, it's the multiverse that we're doing the explaining of our particular initial conditions. 
and the way things work in our universe. But then presumably Smolin will still be left with the task. If he really wants to explain all things, explaining you know, the overarching structure. I mean, now, if the overarching structure is a result of pure reason, or we can get to it through a priori reasoning, then we might think we have rational reasons for thinking it, where it's self-justifying. In one of your slides, you say, you know, somehow the conditions of explanations for M-theory are going to arise from within the theory itself. And so I'm wondering, what does Smolin say about this issue, if he really wishes to explain all things? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that uh, it's another line of argument you can raise against him in a way saying that, well, if you want to explain everything by postulating the existence of uh, a multiverse, uh, how to describe an M theory, well, you will, for instance, if you take the multiverse, you still have to explain the existence of the multiverse, so you still have more philosophical work to be done to say why there is this multiverse, and also why um, there is this fundamental law of nature. Um, so I guess, yes, there is some progress made when you, you replace um, what seem to be arbitrary parameters in some laws by um, some space-time geometries, and you say all of them exist. You can see this as a progress in, in, in the chain of explaining everything. But at some point, you will have to terminate somewhere, right? Or, I mean, it's the old Aristotelian problem of explaining first cause, right? And I don't think that's going to explain this. So, um, I think it's important to contrast Smolin with the multiverse, actually, because he wants to do something much more radical, which is introduce this idea of evolving laws mm -hmm. in order to, in effect, have a unique solution. So he's actually, he thinks of the multiverse as one sign of a crisis that leads to this more radical proposal. But I was curious, uh, I'd, I'd like to compare your take on string theory as a possible final theory with uh, Ricard David, who's written about the features of string theory that might give it a particular character as a candidate for a final theory. And I'm wondering if Ricard would like to comment on that, just because I know he's considered this question. I wonder how it relates to the discussion we're having. You mean the, the status of, of the multiverse, or the possibility to, uh, to confirm it? No, I mean about, you have a, a line about string theory as a final theory, a theory with no uh, free parameters and how. Right, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that that the, the understanding that a theory is final um, in conjunction with other arguments that, that can support the theory uh, can increase trust in, in, in that theory. Um, I don't think that, that, that this necessarily means that one should have a priori a very strong preference for, for finality. I think it, it, it's something we either find when we look at nature or, or we don't. So, so I think I, I would put it a little bit in between being a very strong guideline that, that one should follow and, and have playing no role at all. So I would think it's somewhere in between in the sense that if one finds indications that, that a theory is finite, uh, that is relevant and that can speak in favor of the theory. Do you want to have a question? I also had, yes, actually I had, I had a question related to that, but before that maybe I, I would want to, to, try to, to try an answer to, to Mary's question, um, which one one point one might make is that one uh, might be uh, convinced of not trying to explain something if one has a uh, trusted theory that tells, up, tells not to do so. So, for example, if quantum mechanics tells us that we shouldn't try to explain um, specific outcomes of experiments based on, on the initial state, then we won't explain, we won't try to explain because we trust the theory. So I think if something of along those lines occurs down the road in connection with, with multiple theories or entropic reasoning or whatever, then it would be a reason to do so. And the, the, the question I, I had for, for Baptiste was, was related to this, 
to this idea that one wants to have a theory without final parameters with just one solution. And it seemed to me that you make that, that argument very strong in motivating or in, in supporting the hypothesis that, that there is a multiverse, uh, which wouldn't quite be the impression I had. I, I would feel that, that the reason one, one endorses the multiverse, uh, are, those reasons are physics reasons based on string theory and based on what one uh, understands about cosmic inflation. And then it comes as a nice additional advantage that it reinstalls this, this old goal of a, of a, of a, a theory without um, any, any, any freedom in, in choosing parameters at a fundamental level or without, um, without being arbitrary with respect to what, what exists, let's say. Um, so my question is, um, do you actually think that that, that physicists try to develop multiverse theories already for that simple reason that they wanted to have it, or wouldn't it rather be the other way, that once they got the multiverse, uh, they thought, oh, actually, that's nice. On that basis, we can retain that old quality we thought that was not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I agree. I completely agree. I'm not sure there is one unique dialectic at play here, probably depends on, on the different individuals. Uh, but yeah, I agree, it, it, it makes sense to be happy uh, if, if we get an explanation of the way uh, of, of uh, the parameters and we uh, can explain that. Uh, I would just point in mentioning that if you use this as a, as a motivation uh, for believing in the existence of the multiverse, then it's, it's problematic. So I agree with you, uh, I'm just mentioning that there is a particular path uh, that we should not have. And this particular path is to say, well, there is a, a landscape problem, which is really the existence of many solutions. And that should be because we want a final theory, I mean, just one solution. I just, I guess, trying to make this uh, motivation explicit. I'm trying to say, well, it's not perhaps the best motivation we should have. But I, I agree with you that if we manage on the way to, uh, to, to explain things with the multiverse, then it's, it's good. Yes, it's good. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I have a comment on this. So I don't think that the majority of physicists would say that the fact that there's a landscape implies that there's a multiverse. So you have to actually buy the uh, various stochastic arguments, and I think uh, there are reasons. I think the majority of string theorists would not go in that direction at the present time. Any final questions? Right. Then we can... Uh,